Hello everyone, this is DJ and this is CG Talks, the podcast where CG guy, CG guys talk about CG. And today uh, I have Emil with me and also we have a special guest uh, who will be joining our conversation, uh, Mr. Michael Bridges. And he is also uh, representing Canopy Games. Am I correct? And I'll yes. give you some space to introduce to, the, to our audience. Yes, that's right. Um, I am a 3D generalist. I've been pl playing around and enjoying Blender for the last, well, it seems like almost a decade. It's not quite, but I've been playing around with it since 2.69, and it has come a really long way. Um, I've taught some uh, courses, getting beginners up to speed. I'm always a big fan in enabling people to actually get into the CG game, whether they want to do it for VFX, whether they want to do it for modeling, animation, bringing their ideas to life. Um, I primarily focus these days on the game development side of things. So instead of just focusing on pure modeling, we focus more down on what's important when using Blender in a game production pipeline. So there's there's so much to cover when it comes to Blender. As, as many people know, when they open it up, it's absolutely uh, bewildering. It's got lots of options there, uh, but it's a free program. And in fact, I often say it's a suite of programs because it's got a UV editor, it's got a render pipeline, and some you know, it, it's not just this one program. It's many, many things bundled together. That's why it's so complex. That's why it's got so many facets to it. Um, and I've always tried to inspire beginners to just get hold of it. And it being free and the rate it's progressing. It's absolutely phenomenal uh, what you can do in it these days. It has its bugs, it has its issues from time to time, but I think we can give it a big pass when it comes to being free and open source, which means that anybody can help develop. And if something's not there for you, if you've got experienced coders on your team, that means that they can actually dive into Blender itself and not only fix their own problem, but also give back to the community as well, which is an absolutely phenomenal thing uh, to be able to do. Mm, yeah, so as you can see, uh, the conversation will be definitely revolving around Blender. I hope I hope we, we can also jump into some other directions, maybe, than just Blender purely, but uh, this will be our main topic. And like the first question I wanted to ask you, because you are also uh, doing some tutorials online and uh, you are selling courses uh, yep. for, be for beginners, I guess, and for more advanced users, am I, am I correct? Or just just the beginner level, what, Prima what primarily at the beginner level at the moment. There is some more intermediate content as well. Uh, we tend to structure our courses around people getting into uh, the game development space rather than just um, intermediate stuff. However, we have uh, the game engine we primarily focus on as Canopy Games is the Godot game engine, um, and with that, again, that's a free and open source engine. And with that, we have got um, some intermediate level. Uh, it's a cops and robbers game we made. So it's, it's multiplayer over the internet. That That's a lot of fun to play. Um, there's a backstory behind how that all came together. Uh, we might touch on that later. But yeah, we, we cater for more intermediate topics as well. So we start on the beginner levels. That's important because as a beginner, you don't know where you might want to start. So having an entry point into many spaces is really important. Yeah, so uh, there, there's like a common belief, I'd say, uh, about Blender uh, that, it's, that it is hard to learn. Like uh, there, there's a steep learning curve. Well, maybe, maybe that's just a general thought about every 3D DCC, but well, would you agree with that statement or is it really that hard to learn? I come from a background where I've been fortunate enough to play with computers for a while. So I, I, I might say something here that may ruffle some people's feathers, may be a bit controversial, but I definitely don't think it's hard to learn. I think that people try to do too much too quickly. What, especially if you're older or you're really skilled in a certain part of your life, starting anything new, you forget that at one point, you know, it's the whole analogy, don't run before you can walk and don't walk before you can crawl. And as certainly as an adult, when you start looking back at all the things you're really, really skilled at now, you forget that that took years to get to that point. So if you're starting from a brand new perspective and you've not really used computer much as well, then you end up in a position where 
you're kind of learning several things on top of each other that does slow down your progress. And being able to move things around in 3D space comes intuitively to me, I think because I played games right from a very early age. So I've been playing in 3D space for ages. At school, I was fortunate enough to play with a, a program called SolidWorks. It's uh, sort of like a baby version of Pro Engineer. And then I was playing with SketchUp. It was owned by Google. It's now owned by Trimble. Uh, still a wonderful architectural tool. So I've been playing with this for years before I actually started using it, if that makes sense. So I come from sort of like a privileged area in that because just part of my life journey, I've touched on it at multiple points. It definitely isn't hard to learn. It's just getting the right learning journey for you. If you've already played with many other structures, and I have this all the time with uh, with with students, I get feedback saying, "I found it a bit slow." That's because they've already they already worked in three D software before, so you're going over some of the fundamentals. And of course, you still end up with people saying, "Oh, you're a bit too fast." So there's this there's this balance that you've got to try and get, which is very difficult to achieve on an online course. Because I, as an instructor, can't look at my class, and certainly not with tens of thousands of people, you can't look at that anyway. Um, but it is a, it's, it's a unique challenge to online learning that you can't get that feedback from students. Are you are you getting this at the moment? Which is which is ultimately why I try to encourage throughout all of my courses, share your work. That's really important. I don't. I, I genuinely am not assessing the quality of someone's model. I'm assessing the quality that they produced for the time that they've been playing with it. So if they're brand new to Blender, I'm going to expect a much different quality, or any or any program for that matter, than if they've been doing it for 10 years. I th and that's something that uh, perhaps online forums can really be challenged with as well, because you, you see all these fantastic bits of artwork and you think, why am I not that good? And challenge uh, sort of comparing yourself to other people is a really good thing to do if you want if you're aspirational and you go i want to be able to produce like that but it's a really bad thing to do because what you should be doing is comparing yourself to yesterday's you so uh, uh, and this is the other thing that's sharing your work if you've got a folder with your work and you're you're going through and you're adding your snippets if i look at the stuff i did two three years ago i laugh and go huh how noddy i was and that's after being seven years into playing around in the 3D space. And I think that everybody should do that. You should keep a catalog and be proud of being able to produce something. A lot of people start modeling something, start coding a game, start creating a bit of music and don't finish. Actually, finishing is a skill set in itself that people forget about as well. So I'd much rather see a finished, simple outcome than something that's really, really detailed in one spot but is never finished. So it's, it's kind of getting that mindset going. And with Blender, again, focus on one area. And, and don't try and do everything at once. Get your modeling skills up. Get your sculpting skills up. Get your rigging skills up. Get your animation skills up. Get your texturing skill sets up. And another thing to remember with all of those things I've just mentioned, in industry, those are all separate jobs. When you're doing it yourself, don't expect to crank out a wonderful masterpiece in in a day as a beginner it's not possible <laughs> unless you're unless you're the mozart of the 3d world then i'll hand it to you but that's an exception more than the rule yeah or just perhaps find find the right people to cooperate with definitely just like, just like team building in in the industry goes right you you have to gather the right people for the right jobs totally yeah. Mm, I wanted to touch up on what you mentioned a while ago. Uh, you're an instructor teaching Blender and you're using Godot. Why choose Blender and choose Godot as the thing you teach? Why, as an instructor, why did you choose that instead of like, oh, I'm going to teach Unity or Unreal Engine or Maya, 3ds Max, the industry standard, right? Yeah, uh, great yeah. question. Um, I don't have a solid answer for it either, but I will say that... <laughs> Um, cost is always something that will block people. Uh, again, mm -hmm. it's 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 hard to visualize the world as a whole. So if you're from somewhere where the average weekly wage is a dollar, which does exist, I, I don't know where that is in the world, but if you want to learn Maya, you're going to have to save up for years and years and years. Yes, they have free student licenses and all the rest of it, but uh, 
and a lot of these softwares are going free now like houdini has the uh apprentice version i think it's called um that gives you free access to it you get certain restrictions which is absolutely fine because you're you're learning to use this tool and i think that's that's awesome that and being able to access it is important now the fact that blender is free means that it's something that many people can have access to and therefore is a good topic to teach. It's highly desired. It's a free program. So there, there's, a, there's a vast array of students that are wanting to learn that particular topic. And the same with Godot. And before Unity and Unreal went free, those two game engines also, you, you were having to pay something to use them. So the moment the Unity, I think Unity went free first, I think. So that ended up being something to teach. And then also uh, Unreal came along as well. I've also taught Unreal, uh, the Unreal game engine uh, with Game Dev TV. Mm -hmm. They uh, have an Unreal course, and I uh, taught sections two and three of that. So that's with a C++ programming language. Um, and I love my coding. It's, it's just there are so many things to juggle. Um, I've got a Trello board full of things that I want to be able to teach. and yeah just can we can we all can have a consensus that the day should be 36 hours long then i can have 12 hours sleep and work for 24 it'd be brilliant <laughs> yeah um yeah so so talking about the, the teaching experience and the learning um i would also ask about the again about the hardest thing um like what what would be your opinion on the hardest concept for a newbie layman coming from a maybe a different background or just a just a kid start starting to learn 3D what would be the, the hardest part to explain because there are some some things that are kind of tangible they are easy to to grasp but but there are some yeah. some trickier areas and what what would be the hardest part i think the hardest part is starting I, I I see people on forums, on Facebook, on whatever space people are working in, Reddits, uh, Discord, all asking, can my computer run Blender? And they ask all of these follow-up questions um, that all sound like, I'm afraid to start and I need someone to just say, yeah, go for it. So if you're listening, go for it. After that, it's it's uh, after you've gotten yourself out of the way of the learning journey, um, it can be finding the writing structure that gels with you. It, I mean, there are hundreds of tutorials out there and you will listen to one instruction and you're like, I love the stuff they're doing, but they go too slow. Or I don't like their voice. I mean, ultimately, you're listening as an instructor to someone, often with, you know, you've got headphones in and everything else. You're listening to someone right next to you. It's like they're talking into your ear. It's not quite like a classroom environment. So little things like mouth noises and things like that can be a big distraction for some people and it's it's difficult if you do that sort of thing uh, technically speaking though going back to the let's say the blender question what's the most difficult thing to learn i think it's using reference material and actually remembering to use reference material so if i were to ask you right now to draw a house a lot of people would draw a cube with a triangle on top of it and maybe a little rectangle coming out of the top and a, a puff of smoke. And then they might draw some rectangles and squares representing the windows. It's great. But you and I will say, oh, that's a house. If I told you to draw a car, you draw like an upside down T with two circles. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's a, a car. But that's not what either of those things look like. So yeah. a lot of a lot of beginners forget about the reference stage. I forget about the reference stage. And it can be incredibly challenging to break that habit. And it also feels like, oh, well, I need to be modeling at the moment, not collecting other people's work or collecting, um, you know, all these different reference materials and angles. But I can guarantee the people who post models and things look out of proportion because there's not a reference image there. You know, something's wrong with this. I mean, you can be so close to getting it right. And like the proportions of a human body are pretty standard. I mean, people have different layers of muscle, fat, they have different breadths and widths and heights, but the ratio between all of these things is roughly the same. And the same goes for other things. Of course, there is there are some exceptions to that. I can't uh, go and get reference material for an alien planet. I can't get reference material for actual spaceships. 
You know, spaceships with wings drive me crazy. I mean, this has got no heat shielding. It's not flying in an atmosphere. Why has it got wings? You know, fair yeah. enough. Uh, that's fantasy. You know, some of these things need to convey other other worlds and have some believability to them. Um, that's, I'm a big fan of The Expanse, for instance, because that really nails the science in it as well. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy Star Wars just like the next guy, but that's not what a dogfight would look in more in real life it would be more like um over in the expanse from a distance and hardly anything happens and when you get hit you're gone so yeah using reference material i think a lot of people fall foul of that and forget to do it and then their their models end up either looking very wrong or slightly off and you can't quite pinpoint why and of course in a program like blender you can just put that image in the background and essentially trace your model from it so and that makes things so much easier. Um, I remember uh, working on Godot Getaway, which is the networking game in Godot. Um, it's like a cops and robbers chasing game. I know what a car looks like, a modern day car, but of course I've, I've never been around 1930s cars. So it's kind of set in the 1930s or like maybe a New York style city. And so the first thing I went is looking up schematics of the Model T and uh, Model A is what I m mainly based a lot of my uh, vehicles on. And only when I did that, I was like, oh, wow, my concept of what my brain thought was a 1930s style car had been morphed somewhat through gameplay and just little things that I kind of remembered. And then I was like, well, how does the bumper attach to this thing? And suddenly my model went from being noddy to accurate and then it didn't really matter the polygon counted or or, or or anything else it was like well actually you can identify that as a as a a model a basically and yeah it feels right but that was only mm. because i chose to use reference material mm. yeah, it kind, kind of reminds me about uh, the exams that uh, like I, I was like going for a different faculty but um uh, but my friends that that went for industrial design, yeah, they had they had like um, pre uh, preliminary exams for the school uh, for that for that fine arts academy, and there was a task to to um, to draw, uh, I think uh, some kind of a farmer's machine or or a car, something like that, mm -hmm. just out of out of your memory, and uh, and they judged it, uh, you know, on the on how how detailed how uh, in depth it was, like the drawing. Of course, they, they were not perfect, but you could see from a drawing that the, that the candidate made, if he really observes things, if he analyzes it, if he remembers small details like connections between elements, how it's made, uh, and that that way you can see if if uh, if someone has that eye and that mindset. Like it's not just about using reference, but about about seeing what's in the reference actually, like what what happens there, and especially the thing that you you said about the sci-fi things. Like people sometimes just do like super, super out of imagination things. And the ones that stick are the ones that connect to some kind of a science, at least something believable. Yeah. Or as as in Star Wars, it's like more going for a more fantasy re reference because it's like, it's really a fairy tale. Like it's, it's in a sci-fi setting, but it's it's really a knight's tale, you know, fairy tale. Absolutely. And you, you raise a very good point there on understanding how things are constructed. I've seen many people try and sculpt characters. And the I genuinely think the most successful characters that I've seen, you see them sculpting on top of what looks more like a skeleton. And they're adding the muscle in. And until they've added like the muscle into the face and the shoulders and all, all the other defining muscles of the body, it's only then that they start adding all the other imperfections on top. So approaching your modeling, or in fact, this could probably apply to anything, uh, approaching your modeling in a step-by-step -step process, what's the, uh, it's called blocking out a lot of the time, what's your basic form? Okay, add your secondary level or your first level details on after you've got that in your secondary level details and only worry about things like, pause and a scar and other minute details maybe a little wart on your witch's nose whatever um you know that's the sort of thing that you shouldn't be focused on right from the very beginning and i again that's maybe another thing that a lot of beginners end up doing is they focus on their model and they focus on a very specific area of their model and that area looks absolutely wonderful 
but they've run out of time and enthusiasm for the thing that they're creating now because they spent one week on the on the face and oh i'll start another model whereas if they had focused on the whole model and then got the details and the other major forms sorted and then went down step by step doing the whole model at the time they'd have had a more balanced model and they could have stopped at any point and also say that that model was finished because they finish that part of the process. It's not just about the end result, it's about reaching sort of intermediate goals along the way. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess the X Wing drives you nuts when you see it. <laughs> well, it goes into the atmosphere, so I'll let it off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so uh, again, like about about the learning process that we are kind of discussing. Uh, I wanted to ask: uh, Do you see like do you see pe people benefit uh, more from 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 using a paid structured course? Like, what's what's the big benefit of you of going that direction, or just yeah. you know going straight head on to the project and maybe watching some random tutorials, like finding answers to your questions that arise, or mm -hmm. this kind of this kind of learning approach, or, or it, how how big is the value of, of going through a structured, in depth course? Yeah, perhaps a paid one. So obviously, I'm going to be biased here. I've got courses on um, on learning Blender and Godot and all the rest of it. So, um, in all honesty, when you start learning, it can be difficult to piece together your own learning journey. Not everybody can do that type of unstructured, un. Um, there's a proper name for it. But anyway, when you're when you're just searching for something and doing it, you can fall into the trap of monkey see, monkey do. You end up literally being able to follow a recipe rather than... Uh, it's a great analogy, actually. Being a cook is being able to follow a recipe. Being a chef is being able to create a meal. And what I see a lot of people potentially falling foul of... I mean, it's brilliant that they're sharing their work, but the internet has really seen enough donuts. Do a variation upon that. And I encourage this. To, this is one of the things in a course structure that can be different because it's a different pace. On YouTube, it's more about getting the information there in less than 20 minutes and pleasing the algorithm and maybe being entertaining along the way. When you're learning something, you can have some of that entertainment in there. That's fine. But you're more pointed. You, you not necessarily labor on a point, but you actually go into detail on why you're using the extrude tool here and uh, setting it to the normal. And look at this, you can change the orientation of that and you go into it in a bit more detail so that the student understands why you're using that tool rather than this tool or that tool. Because um, I've often said at the end result is what matters. So there's a big argument in 3D about whether or not you should use quads. Well, that's not the argument. The argument is what's your end result? If you are trying to make a 3D animated character and you make it out of a series of n-gons, you're going to have, when your model moves, really horrible artifacting where you, you'll end up with creases in the wrong place and you'll be tearing your hair out. And it's simply because it's not quads, so when it's bending, it can't deform in a predictable way. But if you were just making a statue and you were just sculpting, you've just completed, going back to those sections, those intermediate stages of a model, you've just completed your, your modeling stage of it. And you may need to then go on to read topology if you want to animate it. But as it stands, it's a fine sculpt. It doesn't matter if it's made up of engons or perfect quads. Ultimately, you've, you've made your prototype and you've stuck it out there. So that's... That's um, I've segued off your main question. I'm going to circle back now to wide paid courses versus uh, a YouTube course. Now, you will find that some people on YouTube have actually produced courses. I've got a free sort of, uh, it's about two hours long in total on YouTube. It's, it's just like I would teach my normal courses and it's there. It's kind of an introduction to Blender to get people just comfortable in the interface. And as an instructor, my personal feeling is that if I've enabled someone to then know what they need to search for in order to carry on their learning journey, that's a big tick for me. So that's, that's a big one. Learning through a structured learning journey enables you to not worry or concern yourself with knowing what to do next. 
what 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 do I now need to learn? What do I what what stage comes after this? If you're following on YouTube, you might be like, oh, how to use particles? Well, particles for what? Hair, object placement. Are you doing a, a part a particle simulator? Suddenly, you get like a list of two hundred awesome tutorials. Don't get me wrong; they're going to be brilliant, but they're only going to focus on a minute set. So you're probably going to have to go through all of them. And then hopefully your brain can somehow stitch all that together into some sort of comprehensive learning journey. But you're going to have gaps in that. So that's one of the certainly one of the ways I try to structure my courses is kind of holistically and circling back occasionally to touch on the same thing we've played with before. But look at what else it can do. Because that's something that, it, oh, uh, I love Infenzia. I love the way that he's picked up Blender um, and he does these 10 minute modeling challenges. And he, he kind of coined a little phrase because he was constantly going E for extrude, S for scale, E to extrude, S for scale. And right at the very beginning, he didn't know the inset tool existed. So he was doing what the inset tool makes something slightly quicker doing. And I was like, oh, that, that's awesome. You know, seeing his progression as he's exploring it. But ultimately, he had a reason for doing it his way. He didn't just say, I want to know 3D modeling. He, he's literally going, I want to create some characters or I want to create some spaceships or cars for the games that I'm developing. So he's got a core purpose for doing that. So he could really focus on what he was trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with what you just said, because I taught myself Blender three years ago and trying to study it online. Wow, like there was a tutorial I watched where he was creating characters and I had no idea why. He would rig it the whole way through. I had no idea what I was doing. And then I'd watch the next tutorial. Someone's making a gun and have like subdivision modeling. It's the perfect thing. And then another video where it's just flat and they have to bake. And I'm like, I don't understand any of these. But yeah, it's just so, so hard. But going back to your um, topic, how did you, um, how do I say this? How do you choose... Or sorry, what what are your thoughts on paid courses versus going to university to learn a subject? Because I think you are there are universities that teach game development, right? Yeah. You, you, you go to student debt, you learn through university, they teach you games, but then people are saying don't do it, just watch paid courses, go there. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on that? That's a mixed bag. That really is. Um, I think we can discuss it but not necessarily mm -hmm. pick a winner because I think it's going to be different for different people. Um, mm -hmm. If you're doing this as just a hobby, then free tutorials online and spending, you know, $50, 50 pounds, whatever it happens to be on a course to get you going, get you more interested. I've got a 3D printer. I want to learn how to model a few more things so I can print that out. If it's a hobby, going to university is, is definitely overkill. If we go, If we go to the other extreme, you want to have a accreditation at the end so you stand out amongst everybody else who's learned online that that's a tick in that box what i think ultimately ultimately matters is uh, if you were applying for a job for instance is a portfolio and a very specific portfolio so if you're actually going for a, a rigging job you should be showing rigging you shouldn't be showing all the gorgeous characters you've created because that's what someone else's job's going to be if you're going for a job in studio. Now, saying that, smaller studios tend to have everybody who handles everything, or there's certainly a lot of crossover. I myself, or um, I would classify myself as a generalist. I pretty know, mm. much know every area of Blender, but I'm certainly not a specialist in every one. And, mm. and ge 3D generalists are those people who hop around, and, oh, you need help over in the texturing department, you go over there. Oh, you need help in the modeling, you go over there. Um, whereas you don't have to do that. You can really focus down on the bit that you're passionate about. And sometimes, let's say a university course, you may be learning things that um, are not really that interesting to you, but they're just part of that curriculum because they add up to the credits that you need in order to complete um, the course. As, as a company and as an employer, I personally would look at someone's portfolio and whether or not they, they they seemed a good person to work with, you know whether if they, it, you know some people you meet them and you're like I don't quite like you I don't know why you know it can be a number of reasons, um, 
it could be that they're just smelly. Who knows? But um, ultimately, it it's it's that sort of personal interaction when you're working in a team, and often because of the file sizes in, involved in all of the assets, you often end up meeting together. That's why um, game studios really exist, rather than just all working remotely. I mean, it's, it's, it's hit us hard over the last 18 months with the pandemic and everything that a lot of people have had to go working remotely. But for instance, I making tutorials, I, I'm, I'm about to get a new editor on and we were talking about working from home versus work. And he's like, oh, it's fine. I've got, I've got really super fast broadband. And I was like, yeah, but if I produce a 200 gig worth of content for you to edit, it's going to take me two and a half days to upload it before you can even download it. So yeah. um, that proximity there. But yeah, I, so I've been in the process of, I suppose, hiring at the moment and uh, specifically for an editing job. And I mainly do a lot of the editing myself. My partner sometimes helps out with that. Um, and again, knowing what skill sets are required for a job is is quite important. Zooming back out and going free and other courses versus uni, I, I, I genuinely think that a mixture of both is probably a good answer to, for, mm. for a, a large number of people. A university that also comes with a great cost associated with it. You mentioned student debt, and that is, mm. um, it depends on your country. Uh, in the UK, for instance, student debt isn't really counted against you until you earn a certain amount and then you start paying it back. And some people can get to the age of retirement having never paid that back and the state absorbs the cost. Um, wow. I don't know what that's like in other places in the world. So again, it, it may depend on the, the, the way that you've approached it. The other thing you could do is perhaps defer going to university if you want to go to university because it's a great place to meet people. It's a great place to network. Uh, when mm -hmm. these things were possible. Hopefully it will become a great place to meet people and yeah. network. Um, I was a real, real introvert when I was, before I went to university. I would be quiet. I wouldn't do anything. I'm certainly not that now. And it's definitely university that brought that out. So it's not just um, the education that a university can provide. It's also the social skills that it can provide as well. I, I, I think that's probably glossed over a lot of the time during these sort of mm -hmm. discussions about learning it's like well it's yeah. not it's a bit more than that i mean you might meet someone at university that becomes your life partner maybe romantically or maybe business wise you know that you might mm -hmm. meet a brilliant coder and you both just click and you're an artist boom you've got the two man team necessary to make games straight away um, so that you i don't think we can just narrow it down to the education side of things of course you can you can still meet people on discord and and all that lot that, that there's no begrudging that but it's still not the same as meeting in person that's that's definitely the fact um i always like meeting people in person if it's possible um but again geographically that's very difficult with working with people around the world but also yeah. there's this pandemic thing at the moment that really screws that up yeah it's really hard yeah yeah that's that's one of the things that i wanted to, to ask you about uh, what's your what's your general view after after so many months of, uh, months of this whole crazy story of the world, like the, the pandemic thing and the remote work, all the things connected with that, like the Blender conference canceled, every, every like the negative yeah. aspects are yeah. kind of obvious to to uh, to everyone, I think. But do you see that uh, in the end it does have some kind of a positive impact as well on the on the game development uh, world or generally? Is there any kind of benefit okay. that it? That it has yeah so how it's affected me i was in a very fortunate position prior to uh the pandemic happening that i have been working from home for the last decade or so um i used to fix computers i still do from time to time so i used to be a computer repairman going around locally helping people set up things you know the st standard things from printers to viruses and all the rest of it so um i worked from home now Fortunately, now I'm more in the uh, course development space that I still work from home. So the main thing that it affected me with is the children were at home instead of at school, which meant that I was working like an eight hour teaching day, an eight hour trying to get uh, course production or videos made and then being absolutely 
knackered because that was non-stop and i'm sure a lot of people can appreciate that being something that's happened to them uh especially if they have kids now as a whole i think it's demonstrated that a lot of companies that said no we can't possibly work remotely suddenly they had solutions to these problems um and i i really value uh, my my time, whether it's with children or whether it's learning something new or teaching, and so I can Im- I can imagine that not having to do a two hour commute every day and gaining those hours. I mean, even if it's just half hour commute and back again, you know, that's an hour of your day gone commuting plus the preparation time and everything. So I think it's been good in that way that people have been able to see that there are other ways of working. As I mentioned before, though, there are some barriers to that. So if you live in an area with absolutely brilliant internet, brilliant. You know, you, you can do a lot of things remotely. And my my internet for context is about 50 megs down and about 15 megs up. The editor mm. that I was talking about has something like 800 down and 100 up. And I was like, you know, it it can be difficult to... Uh, with most things, it's difficult to understand someone else's perspective because you're like, well, it's fine. I can do it. And I'm like, no, nope, that's going to take me a while to do. So um, and I certainly experienced that when when teaching went online, when when my children were watching the class remotely. It turns out that the school is in a remote area and doesn't have the best Internet. But on top of that, all of the teachers are doing the same thing. So you end up with contention on their own network and it it would fall apart so i think if the infrastructure's there then it's it's absolutely perfect but i I think infrastructure in certain places of the world um including you know first world countries still needs to improve to really make working from home accessible to everybody the fact is if it's not accessible to everybody then you could argue it's not a solution to everything um and I, I think moving out, people moving back out of cities is probably really good for their health as well, in general. Yeah, I think it's an interesting thing you touched up on, but a bit of a tangent. But since you're an instructor, you have experience creating courses. You record video online uh, at home. You, yeah. you record your vo- voiceover. And then you you said that your kids go to online classes and around the world, the same situation, right? They all have to watch their teachers over Zoom or whatever software and learn. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts between that system of like online learning versus them just creating a course? Maybe the school is just create that each teacher just creates their own course and then has the students download it for them to watch that nobody has to deal with that. And then maybe a weekly meeting or something like that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great a great question. And I think we need to zoom out to a bit of education theory and and how children work to really answer these or like the child question i know for instance that my daughter who's eight can actually do a bit of self-guided learning i can give her some maths and she can work through it we can discuss where she's had difficulties so there's that interaction bit that i'll come back to in a moment and then she can continue on again uh my son who's six he's a squirrel in the garden and he can't focus on that video he doesn't want he wants to play minecraft or roblox or something that's more engaging um and certainly those those games themselves can be used educationally um i i love seeing how the children have thought about their house designs and how they've developed over the years oh i've made you a bedroom and and but mine's got a skylight so i can see the stars (laughs) but glass is too expensive so you don't have that and you know those sort of um discussions arise um but I think uh, going back to that interaction, I think that's key. I think online learning could be an absolutely brilliant supplement to in-person learning. They kind uh, The two kind of go against one another when it comes to what's great about in-person learning is the negative, is, 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 a positive for in-person learning is a negative for online learning and, and vice versa. So online learning, I've taught more students now than I could possibly do, even if I worked at a university with 100 people in a lecture every day. Uh, You know, the scale of being able to teach that many people is absolutely amazing. Um, And and being able to affect that many people's lives and make them a better artist and send them on their way and seeing their work and their progression, phenomenal. 
but I've not been able to speak to them. I've not been able to give them all critical feedback. It's just impossible. I worked out at one point if I was to sit down and answer every question that I had on all of my courses and had no sleep, it would take me 27 days. And that was a few years ago. 27 days of just you know, opening up the question, thinking about it. Some of them would take five or six minutes to respond because I had to go take some screenshots to point them in the right direction, etc. That's something that you don't get. And also the communal questions. In a classroom environment, someone's going to ask a question that everybody can hear and everybody gets the answer to. Now, that question may come up in the next semester with a different class, but you've answered that question for everybody. Everybody in the room has been able to look at it and go, oh, yeah, I was thinking about that wrong. Online, and fortunately, a lot of places have sort of like the question and answer systems that if you type in something similar, it gives you a uh, sort of like other questions that are asked. This happens on Stack Exchange and other places like that. However, your question might be slightly different, but still have the same answer. And because you're not going through, and often it's a text-based rather than a sort of like a tutorial-based answer, it can be difficult to follow. I've, I've had it with coding personally. So I'm trying to skill up all the time when it comes to coding because it, it, as an artist, it's actually really beneficial being able to manipulate Blender with code to do something that would, uh, a great example, exporting game assets in a certain format with a certain orientation or origin set point. I wrote a script to do it. The great thing then is when Jan, my business partner, asked me to, oh, could I have these all changed to do this? I just clicked a button. I did the changes to all of the models and clicked a button. And that instead of that taking over an hour and a half to do, it was done in 10 minutes. You know, being able to implement that skill. But yeah, um, going back to sort of like the coding thing, I often will sort of Google foo a question and hopefully get something that's roughly the answer. But it doesn't give me any further understanding. We can't, I can't talk around that point uh, and say, oh, do you see why this affects X, Y, and Z? It's, it's because, and then you can go into further explanation and go a bit in detail. And I do ask people all the time, you know, if you've got a question for me and it's something that a lot of people can benefit from, you know, it's not a, would you mind assessing my, my, all my projects for me. It's like, no, I don't, sorry, I don't have the, I'd love to, but I really don't have the time to give personal service to it, everyone. Um, but if you ask a, a good question that I can answer in a video format, that's something that I can put on YouTube for free. And if anybody ever has the same question, you can point them at that resource that guides through and perhaps talks around a, a problem as well. There was uh, there was a great one a few months back uh, on a Facebook group. Someone had all of these metallic balls um, sort of like grouped together in a sphere. And I was like, I can think of about six ways to do that. So I sat down and went through all six ways. And I was like, oh, yeah, dupliverts. So you get like an icosphere and you instance on each one of the uh, vertices of the icosphere another sphere. I was like, boom, done. This is awesome. Um, <laughs> but that was the sort of thing where I love playing and I encourage people to play um, with Blender as well. And, and and getting things wrong is part of the learning journey. It really is. I get things wrong all the time. Um, I've got a clip that I, I'm not going to show anyone because I, I, I use a bit of blue language in it. Um, but I'm doing something and I accidentally type it was with a particle system, and I was changing the number of children. So each particle could spawn 10 children. So therefore, for every particle, there's 10 times more children being shown. And I accidentally use a slider to slide it up. And I don't know at this point how much it's going to slide. And it, and it went all the way up to something like 140 or something. And Blender locked up for a few seconds and came back again. And I was saying to the camera at the time, Oh, uh, well, be very careful with typing in large numbers because it has a, a massive effect on everything that you're doing. And I immediately go back, click, and I've assumed in my mind, because it's highlighted, the next figures I'm going to type in, I was just going to down it to something like 20. It didn't delete. It just appended 20 to the end of it, and I pressed enter. And I Im immediately realized that I've now got 14,020 part uh, children on my particle system and i just look back at the camera and i'm like oh bleep <laughs> do it 
<laughs> what and i just warned people about it and i went and did it and i was like this would this could be a funny skip but at the same time that was 40 minutes into a recording i was like that's that's it at that point i, I chucked that tutorial away i'll come back to it another day yeah yeah but that, that was kind of like you know show showing that that in real life why you shouldn't really do it so you, should, you should let people see that right uh, and I'm thinking like um, uh, <clears throat> about about Blender in general as a tool. It being being a community based project, like a lot of it, a lot of the development so relying on people, people's initiative, and kind of like the whole mindset of of the open source nature of Blender. Uh, do you see that this this also? It's kind of like a DIY approach to to doing things, right? Uh, just just do it yourself, like uh, build up an add-on, code some you know, script, whatever. Uh, does that uh, does that also leverage uh, kind of like a learning attitude? Uh, certainly, if you're if you're, there are definitely different people and uh, with different learning styles and what works for them. Um, there's a great Veritasium video on you're not a kinesthetic learner. You know, all of that's been denounced for years. Uh, everybody benefits from every type of learning. Some people are, are just, they, they've done more learning through books. So naturally, they turn to books because that's always helped. And some people have always done practical things. It just turns out that some things are more practical than others. And it's easier to work in that way. Uh, you should check that out. I don't have a link for it, but it's it's one on, one on the Veritasium channel. But when it comes to actual learning, it can be uh, there is a a great dichotomy between people who are driven, intrinsically motivated, to develop themselves as a person and develop their skill set without reward. The doing of it is the reward. They, they learn for the sake of learning. They always seek out new knowledge. Um, I'm starting to sound like the Star Trek intro at that point. Um, but then you get people who are more trained to, ex they're externally motivated. They will, they will do something if there is a reward. You know, if, if you dangle a thousand pounds in front of me, I will do that. Otherwise, I can't be bothered. And those are often the type of uh, learners. I mean, that's not just with learning. That's with a lot of things. Um, but those are often the type of learners, the extrinsically motivated, they need to be set goals rather than be open-ended. I can almost guarantee someone who's externally motivated would hate Minecraft. I mean, there is a goal in it to kill the Ender Dragon and return. But that's it. That, you know, it's, it's not actually a big game, but the, the sandbox that it provides people to create their own stories. I mean, that's, that's a great example of intrinsic motivation. They, they, they just want to create their own stories in there. Whereas um, a more story-focused game where you do this, do this, do the, the next thing, do the following thing, where it's really laid out. Um, some people hate the, the on-rail shooters, for instance, where you're just following a linear path through the game. And obviously some games try and mix those bits together as well. Um, but coming back to education, if you're, if you're externally motivated, um, the fact that you've bought a course and you've put money down on that course means you're probably more motivated to take it than just looking up some, some YouTube videos. So there can be a psychological element to paying for something when it comes to your learning because you feel like you've got... You, you've got something there. You're, you've got a tangible thing that you're betting. It's a bit, a bit like if anybody's ever played poker, changing those chips out for pennies or cents, you know, whatever country you're in, um, changing that out to real money has, a, even though it's pennies, has a scientifically proven effect on the way that people will play the game, especially if it's their own money. Or if you put a, you know, a pot of money on the side, it's still not as strong and then play with chips. It's still not as strong as actually playing with real real money. And obviously casinos know this because that's why you get chips. You're not playing with your real money because then you'd be more afraid of losing it the more you abstract it. And again, that's used in games with loot boxes and things like that where you have to buy, what is it, Minecraft, uh, not Minecraft, sorry, yeah. Fortnite's V-Bucks and then Apex Coins or whatever it is. They all play on that psychological trick of 
Well, if you're paying with a credit, it doesn't quite work. Fairground rides do it as well. You know, you go into a fairground and you exchange at the beginning some money for tokens and then you don't know what the tokens really mean anymore. So um, how, I, I did say at the beginning, didn't we, that we'd segue in tangent into strange things. We're now talking about gambling. But yeah, it can, it can, mm. you can use those psychological tricks on yourself as well. So um, there's a great service on the internet called Beeminder. And it might not be easy to track things in it, but you you, lit- uh, you literally put money in. And if you don't reach a goal, your money goes, I think it goes to a charitable organization. But you, you've got money on the line there. They will charge your account and take it from you if you don't meet a goal that you've set. Um, it's, it's a great one for things like weight loss, because like, if you've got smart scales, you go stand on them etc i don't know if it links into any education services yet but you could certainly um manage that yourself obviously you could squirrel out of things if you wanted to um but those sorts of things holding yourself accountable and that's a great thing about um finding someone anyone who's in a similar field to you and actually committing to doing something for them so yan for instance we're working on an action rpg at the moment and Jan's focused on most of the coding. I'm doing most of the assets. But if he needs something, I can't just dilly dally about it and 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 do it at some point when I feel like it, because him not having a player character means he can't really test out the animations. So there's there's a natural blockage there and a reason to get on with something. Mm. And giving yourself that reason to do education is much better. So um, if if you again this is extrinsic motivation it's the thing that if you pass your exams if you do this chapter of this course you will get 10 pounds or whatever the domination of money that's for extrinsic people for intrinsic motivation you just need to give them good content and an idea about how they want to progress once you've gotten to a a certain point in your learning journey you can start to deviate and be more specialized. And then, you could, then you'll also have the knowledge to search for specific problems. Uh, when I started coding uh, in Python in Blender, I didn't know much about the Blender API, how I interface via code. So I was very, very slow because I had to discover what these various things were. However, once I had a little bit of knowledge... I was able to then go forward and ask better questions and forward my lo- knowledge and forward my uh, learning with it much, much better. Yeah, uh, so you mentioned Jan, and uh, that's that's uh, one question about I wanted to ask maybe at the very beginning, but we kind of started with a different topic. So I wanted to ask about Canopy Games and you know what's the what's the origin story of the whole venture, so- like how it, how it all started. Yeah, um, great question. So we were playing around. We were both uh, making courses with Game Dev TV um, a few years back, 2018, I think. And we worked together on a little prototype. So in four hours, we had this little game jam where we made a a cube dude kickabout, which is a a, a guy made out of cubes, literally. And then we deform, we rig him, we animate him. So he's running around and then it, it's a little foot, two-player football game. It turned out to be a great hit with the team as well. Everybody was laughing and playing with it. And we even discovered a bug during the gameplay that was the game would reset after like three seconds. But the score counter, as you kicked the ball over the line, if you could kick it over again before the game reset, it turned, it kept counting up your score. So the game very quickly turned to how many times can you kick the ball over the line before the timer goes because you could score like... 200 goals in a few seconds Uh, but anyway we we really enjoyed working with each other there and then in 2019 i think it was we uh, we we officially started working together and produced godo getaway the cops and robbers a multiplayer game and we took we taught how to make that as well we learned a lot from that experience unfortunately because we were doing something in parallel i was creating assets and he was creating a game but we were also creating courses course content on that he had all the prototype assets in his game and not the like the final finished assets which was a bit of a shame so um 
we kind of we did learn a lot from that and what also um people need from a more intermediate style because Jan had already done a, a sort of a beginner course the uh, I forget what it's called discovering Godot um, so that's a beginner course that he'd done so we wanted to focus on a more intermediate uh, topic and of course we bit off more than we could chew because that whole started uh, the whole thing started is Jan made a driving around game I put on some electro swing and then it changed the way that we played. And suddenly we had this kind of free form driving around a city type game. To, and I made it cops and robbers by just keep continually chasing Yan around the map. So it be, And we had a lot of fun doing that. So then it became a cops and robbers game. So it's, it's interesting how the game idea developed by just playing a sandbox and then forming a game from it. Um, so yeah, we came together, we did that. And then we've, we've just gone further and further from that. So, um, he focuses mainly on the coding at the moment. I'm trying to up my skill in Godot itself because I'd love to help him out, um, even if it's just with the uh, some of the things on the side, things like uh, shader code or just getting the animations working in mm. in Godot. Um, that's still a bit of an alien environment for me. I can go in and do very specific things. I can go in, for instance, and set up assets ready for him to use, but that's that's about it for the moment. Um, but I am I'm getting there slowly with it. So again, that's an example of complementing a coder with with an artist, able to then go forward and um, help each other, and also help each other's progression. So we're able to um, lean on each other where it's necessary. Like I can ask a very specific. I've got this really cool thing that I can do in Blender because I've got this functionality available to me, and it's like that doesn't exist in in the game engine. Oh, okay. Well, we're going to have to produce our assets in a, a slightly different way so that they work in the game engine itself. Yeah, you, you mentioned Godot engine, and I, I'm finding like it being used on such such a variety of of different games, and even like we had an interview in, in some episode back uh, back in time with uh, with uh, Heavy Poly and mm -hmm. Link, who's doing who was doing like. He was doing Blender teaching and other stuff, and now he mainly focuses on developing his own, his own painting app, and he's, he's yeah. doing it in in Godot, like yeah, a painting awesome. app. Just a... well, it's it's Something it's not widely crazy. known, although it should be because we keep repeating it everywhere. So eventually, it will be widely known that the Godot game engine is a Godot program itself. So you're mm -hmm. actually using something that's built in its own engine, which is kind of mind warping initially and then you go oh that that shows you the power of the underlying the uh, the underlying code of it so it's it's a, a really good game engine again most of these things come with their quirks it's certainly um a great tool for getting into game development very very quickly because it's very simple to use the gd scripting language to to quickly get a a prototype game out and and from there if you wanted it to be triple a quality and really shiny and pretty then you might want to take that example code that you've got and do some translation and move it over to mm. unreal you know that's the it's it's entirely um up to you where you want to build your game and obviously those other game engines have their quirks they have their benefits they have their drawbacks um if you produce i mean everybody's always scared of the if you produce a game that brings in i don't know what the cutoff is a hundred thousand dollars a year or, or yeah. something that leverages that engine you have to start paying fees across mm -hmm. um yeah, yeah or, or or just open up the champagne <laughs> <laughs> really yeah 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 at that, yeah. At that point if i produced a game that uh, that was bringing in a hundred thousand a year that would be a big yeah tick in my box that'd be a, a phenomenal achievement <laughs> yeah yeah so following follow, following up on this i would ask you what what is the a arpg I'll be action RPG. Project. So yes, yeah. uh, we're doing a kickstarter campaign at the moment so much like we did with god of getaway um, the reason for a Kickstarter and not just doing it uh, is is the whole development cost of producing a course. There is a a very strong misconception, and it irks people who do produce videos about it. Um, the the standard person watching might think, "Oh, all you do is turn on your camera and talk to it." Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I've I've seen other other creators. I know you've had Aaron on here in the past. Um, I've seen some his Resolve timeline. 
that isn't just turning on a camera and recording. That is a lot of edits. And it, mm. it's it's true. To make a video polished, it does take a number of edits. And it takes planning to make sure that the learning structure is right. I mean, I probably go through a, a, a typical course or a typical section of a course which may be around 20, 10 to 20 lectures long on average. Each one of those videos will be about 10 minutes on average. It will vary depending on what we're doing during it. But I'll need to run through that learning journey. And even when you map something out, when you go to teach it, there are these there are desk slam moments where you're just thinking, oh my word, I haven't taught this yet. I'm trying to do something that they can't do yet because I've not taught this other fundamental. Mm -hmm. So you end up with a a flow chart of of progression that you need to really, really make sure you don't deviate from. You can't do certain things before others if you're teaching beginners. There are certain things that you can, once you're more advanced or later on in the section, you can hop about a little bit more because there's there's a sort of unwritten understanding that if you're on section two or section three that you've watched the previous sections you know so um it can be <laughs> it can be challenging especially if someone's jumped forward and you often i i often see this where a, a student will jump forward to something that interests them which is a great thing to do and then they ask a question which is literally the previous lecture or is literally the follow-on lecture. It's, it's amazing how often that happens, that their question comes up in the following lecture because then we sort of dissect what we've done so far and that sort of thing. So it's it, that, that's really interesting how, how, how students engage with the course and how we try and structure things so that it's um, easy to go through. There has to be repetition. I know some, uh, you know, when you're watching a YouTube video, that's not always necessary. And I, when I'm doing YouTube videos, I try not to repeat myself. But when you're learning something for the first time, repetition is absolutely important. It's, it's, it's a key thing that you need to do. If you don't do the thing over and over again, you're not going to remember it. Unless you're one of those very lucky p uh, people who when someone says something, it's like, like a photographic memory they're like think yeah i've got it next thing please mm. most people um can't learn by just having one thing come up and then they move on and that's that's one of the disadvantages i've had with more advanced courses i still buy courses by the way i, I you mm. know i'm not i, I, I never pretend to be uh, a know-it-all i always look at a course and i judge its value on the knowledge there can it level me up Often the answer is yes. Uh, but unfortunately, the more advanced courses also tend to cost a bit more. And for good reason, they're covering topics that take ages to get right in a video. Um, yes. But going back to the going back to the Kickstarter itself, so we're, we're, we're almost funded, in fact. We're at, um, uh, I think, 84% or something at the moment. And we've structured it, structured it in such a way that there's a, a couple of learning paths that people can go down. We've got three... three main learning paths we've got the music um i call it music art and coding so the coding is going to be primarily in godot and the art's going to be mainly in blender and there's a uh, a door a digital audio workstation called lmms and that will be where the music's done all of these programs are free so there's no barrier to entry for people taking the courses they don't also have to have bought an expensive piece of software i love fruity loops that's my personal go-to a workstation but uh you know even at 79 dollars for the very very ba the, the the basic version that's a that's a big call to have on top of something so um yeah so you've got these paths and we've separated it into various stretch goals so we've got a an initial funding goal of six thousand pounds for a core game a couple of blender courses and asset packs as well if people wanted to add those on there's something there for everybody i suppose and finally the music side of things as well and the way that we've structured our stretch goal um thinking about how we want people and more people involved in in the actual kickstarter is instead of saying to people oh if you want these extra things then you've got to add it on to your existing pledge that felt to us a bit like trying to nickel and dime people who actually want to support us because the early backers are often your fans people who have been following you for a while and we d we didn't want to do that certainly so we we said 
Okay, for the stretch goals, when we reach 8, 10, 12, we, I think we chose two grand increments, we would add more to the learning journey. So we would expand the courses that, that are there already. So we would, we would end up with more and more content for people, both in the asset packs, in the, in the Blender side of things, in the Godot side of things, and, of course, uh, music production as well. Yeah, uh, I think it's interesting that you mentioned polishing videos and how you had to go back and like, oh, think, think what you're going to teach, right? What are your thoughts on, I guess, the imposter syndrome of teaching a course, right? Where you go to art station, you're going to see like industry sta- industry workers, right? Uh, from EA, from, from big yeah. studios, and they'd sell a course and people would buy the course, but it's like super long. They don't really teach that well. But you're learning from them because they work in the industry versus somebody who makes a structured course that teaches you every single little thing in a much but in a much more, I guess, condensed version. What are your thoughts on those? And how do you deal with deep, it? Deep deep question. Um it's a challenge you mm-hmm. again, it's a bias I'm gonna give a biased answer here, of course. I think mm-hmm. you can learn a lot from someone who's been in industry for absolutely years and has mastered their craft. So, I mean, there are some great, um, I forget his name now, um, but there's a, there's a great tutorial on, on sculpting essentially. And it's mm-hmm. basically if you follow it and you, it, it, no, if you follow, it's the wrong thing to say, because if you follow along with it, you still won't be able to achieve what that artist of 15 years can do. Mm-hmm. I think I, I, I think that's a, a key point here, that a lot of being amazing in whatever you do, whether it's you know playing piano, painting, creating games, a lot of that comes from just doing the thing. It, the 10,000 hours, we've all heard of that by this point in our lives. Mm-hmm. Doing things for 10,000 hours, you become pretty good at it, including doing nothing, by the way. If you if you sit down twiddling your thumbs, you get quite good at doing that as well. Um, so when it comes to structuring a course, I I deliberately do not try to outshine my students. I could sit there and do a time lapse at the end of something and produce something amazing. And does that make the students feel great about what they've achieved? Again, a little bit of a psychological hack here that the teachers Mm. made this and I did something that was better. Brilliant. I mean, at the stage of learning, especially beginners, I expect to see, um, in fact, uh, on the free course on YouTube, I show people that you don't even have to go into edit mode. You don't have to move vertices around. Just grab a series of primitive objects and shove them together. Boom. You've got a mech. Um, And it's just like it, it, it. It boggles my mind that people think that they need to be more advanced than they actually need to be. I mean, you could do this in a game engine. You could open up uh, a series of cylinders and spheres, put it together, and you'll end up with a mech or you end up with a house. Okay, it's not going to be great. It's going to have tons of performance issues. But hey, you're creating your first, second, maybe 10th game. Performance is something you come back and you circle to and you do analysis of your of your game running and you come back to it and you go okay the physics engine is calling you know the physics process is running at 20 milliseconds we need to work on deactivating physics in certain parts of the level because that's what's causing it and suddenly your physics process drops back down to uh five milliseconds and you're like oh that's great because the total is under 16 which is that magical uh 60 frames per second so it's little things like that. Um, again, trying to walk before you can run. Optimizing your models is not something you should be doing from the uh, from the very beginning. It's something you should always be mindful of. Of course, that that's key. It's, it's not. I'm not saying don't worry about it for the sake of being flippant and saying it's not important. It's don't worry about it because it's not important at the moment. Mm. It's th- there's a critical distinction there um, between making sure that you've got a in this case a model that's that's optimal i mean hey if it works it works and you will see i I, hacking your way through something is not necessarily a good thing to become good at but it is a way of getting something done quickly to test an idea the the great one in 3d modeling is the huge argument that happens about using booleans 
So for the listeners who that's an alien word to, to um, it's not programming, true or false, but say you've got a cylinder and you pass it through a cube, you've now got, and you say a sub- subtract one from the other, you'll end up with a cube with a hole going through it. That is very bad topologically. It will destroy, you won't have nice, neat topology, how the vertices, edges, and faces are all laid out. And you will end up with shading artifacts at some point. And those can be worked around. But as, it doesn't make them bad assets. If you're trying to mock up a level and you need a cube with a hole through it as part of your models, boom, it's in the game. It's taking you 30 seconds to do rather than the long-winded way of making an inset, making sure you've got the right... Um, num- I mean, this is still quite a quick process, but one takes 30 seconds, one takes two minutes. Multiply that by 100 assets and you've just wasted a day being perfectionist about models that don't need to be... Uh, amazing let's put it that way they just need to be in place and represent the thing going back to earlier in the in the in the talk where i was saying about if i was to ask you to draw a house sure i'm going to give you a square with a triangle on top maybe a chimney and some windows that are also funny shaped squares because you're not going to make sure it's a perfect some people will but most people won't won't make sure it's a perfect square they'll be slightly bowed in and everything so it's going back to that sort of analogy when you're trying to mock ideas up there is a certain level of quality you want to hit but i i think people may focus too much on the end product rather than um going and getting a block work done first of all and to define Yep. The funny thing about the booleans is uh, is that you know in the three D mesh modeling that's that's kind of like the uh, yeah the, part, the thing that you tend to avoid because it causes some artifacts and really in CAD modeling this is the way to go like the, it's the way of of modeling in in NURBS and stuff like that exactly so, yeah um going back to it SketchUp, all depends on the context yeah SketchUp is a great great program where you can do that sort of operation and it handles it because mathematically it calculates that geometry in a different way to how Blender calculates its geometry um again there are many ways of representing the 3D world on a computer and that's a, uh, as you said that's a great example where if you've come from those other packages solid works will also um and pro engineer also nerve space modeling um and i think sketchup is nerve space modeling as well so there aren't any polygons there so you can do these mathematical calculations where you're cutting through models and then when you export it, the topology is still going to be rubbish in if you needed to deform the model and things like that. But again, speed and workflow. Um, ultimately, uh, we've talked a lot about Blender. Uh, Blender is just a tool. If you've got Marmoset, if you've got Substance Painter, if you've got X, Y, and Z, there are hundreds of other programs that you can interface, come in and out of Blender to get an achievement. So w- one of the great things that I've seen people do and this is a workflow that um, someone I know, Kev, Kev Binge, his YouTube channel, he, he works with Houdini day in, day out. But he will export a VBD of an explosion or smoke, or, so a volume database, I think it is. Uh, so the, the actual volumes, because using something like Houdini to make your, your smoke simulations is not only quicker, but more effective than trying to use Blender at the moment. Of course, you need a paid-for version of Houdini to do that, but he exports the VBD and brings it into Blender for rendering, because rendering in Blender is much better than in Houdini. So it's a great example of using the best tool you've got at the time to actually generate your your outcome. Um, and you could you can make pixel art in in Blender, whether or not you're rendering out 3D models or rendering out uh, a picture you've made with the grease pencil. Is it the best one? For- no. I would use Asprite, I think. If I if I was to pick a pixel art tool straight off the shelf, I would not. And again, I think that's like eight dollars. It's it's well worth the time picking up a tool that does your job well. If especially if you can justify it as a business thing. It, mm. it when whenever you're running a company, um and I think this is where a lot of the I don't want to pay for things comes from, is mm. they're not having it as an income. It's a hobby. The moment Blender becomes your income, you actually care about workflows that make it quicker, easier, faster to to actually pump out the thing you're getting paid for. 
So hard ops and box cutter are two great hard surface modeling tools that can be bought for Blender. I don't know what the price is on Blender Market at the moment. Let's say it's $40. A lot of people go, oh, I don't want to pay $40. Blender can do all of this manually. Yes, but instead of making 50 models in a day, you're going to only make five because of the workflow improvements it makes. And that might not matter to someone who's just playing around in Blender and having it as a hobby. Um, which is why in the Kickstarter, we've decided to actually include asset packs because the assets themselves are all going to be Godot pat compatible. So they will work out of the box in Godot. They will work in other game engines as well. Uh, but they will be specifically set up. There are some brilliant um, Kenny. Kenny produces some awesome, amazing assets. And they work almost perfectly in Unreal. Mm -hmm. And they work perfectly in uh, Unity. But things like the origin position in Godot cause the physics to go nuts. So you have to go in, in Blender, alter all of those, re-export and go around. So there, there, there's a much bigger workload to be able to do. So suddenly picking up this asset and dumping it in Godot is going to be a real godsend for anybody who wants to develop in that engine itself. And again, you might not want to or have any inclination of making your own models outside cubes and cylinders and spheres to represent where things are going to go and then moving on from there. So, yeah, that's why we approached with the game assets as well. We thought that would be a good thing to have if you're not interested in having your uh, d developing your own um, <laughs> sort of assets, just having it there to just pick it up and use it. And they'll be mainly focused around medieval stuff so where they'll uh, there'll be medieval weaponry in there props dungeon assets there'll be uh, if, as as it goes up they there's more and more assets mm -hmm. giving myself tons of work here i know um and it is a lofty goal for a reason we want to um encourage as many people as possible and later on there are things like even a, a more characters enemies bosses all of these things will obviously take time to develop but there'll be asset packs people can use and pick up and and without restriction basically with the, with the one exception that you can't repackage them into your own asset pack i mean that's that yeah. that's a bit common sense but yeah that'll be the only restriction on them so yeah personally i think that sounds amazing um i think everybody knows that when you have to make a game for yourself and then you have to think of all the art assets you have to do it takes up so much time and it's really interesting that you brought up with so while um you're you're right where everybody who does 3D as a hobby, can use other software. Like say, you want to make a map, right? You can use XNormal to bake your map, but you might take an R to bake your ambient occlusion. But then you can use something like Marmoset or Substance and they'll do it in like a third of the time, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, 3D scanning software. Um, I got into photogrammetry and mm -hmm. there's a mesh room is a free um, photogrammetry tool so you take lots of photos of an object yeah. and you put those photos into this program and it spits out a textured object at the end of it that mm -hmm. often needs a lot of cleanup but it's it's pretty phenomenal what can be done um, and it takes ages it's only available yeah. to people with nvidia cards so there are you know there's mm -hmm. some restrictions there um, it's a shame that it can't be computed on a cpu and the laptop is okay I'll leave my laptop running overnight. I don't care. I want to process it, etc. But there are loads of other ones as well. And they've they recently changed their um their payment structure where you buy credits mm -hmm. and then you use up your credits during yeah. the time you're processing. I can't remember of the name of it. It's the a rea it. reality capture. Reality, reality yeah. capture, yeah. yeah. Absolutely phenomenal program. And I was amazed. I I you know, I paid for some credits. I've got some photos because I've got hundreds of photos in my on my mm -hmm. phone's library where I've gone around and I've gone snap, snap, snap. Yeah. I put it in there, clicked a button. It was like, yeah, this is done for you. I'm like, that, okay. Yeah. Now is the example of an, waiting an hour with a spinning wheel and it might crash at any point and seeing the progress and it being put together in real time. It's, and I was like, this is so much quicker. Yeah. But again, I'm not using it day to day. So when it was a subscription model, I was, no, no, I can't pay. I think it was like mm. 30 quid a month for something that I'm going to use once a year that sort yeah. of thing or or once every time i come back from holiday because i found a cool uh object to to yeah. photograph that's a it's like sorry go ahead no it's it's like you say that you you kind of measure how much how much is that really an investment in something that you will that you will be using as a tool to to gain some income income in the end right so it's about that, that attitude is it is it just like spending on your hobby 
or or does it feel like an investment really yeah, yeah definitely so the same the same the same follows up to to, to the render farms that we are running the, the kind of business we we get asked the question about is the farm free or something like that like people get the idea of a free render farm like from from ship it for example yeah which is not really in fact free it's like more of a community founded because because people are putting in their computing power right it's, yeah. it's also someone's paying the electricity bills it's just a community found, funded yeah i ended, venture, i ended right? up building my own little render farm um i got an old um xeon workstation with seven pci slots so i ended up putting graphics cards in there and i use that as my brute force render farm when possible but even that doesn't compare I've, i had to do a cycles uh it was it was just a cycles render for one of the videos in the course and i was sat here and i, I started rendering and the, it was taking it was about five minutes per frame it was quite a complex render with some um procedural shaders in it so it was taking a while to compute every time and i i just sat and went now i can't use my computer or the render one through there for the next and i don't know what it was it was like the next day and a half and i was just like you know what i i'm just gonna pay the 50 dollars or whatever this is gonna cost because now i can use my computer again for producing videos you know it's it's it it feels a bit of a pain because I'm like, oh, fifty dollars. But it was I needed it to finish off the video. I didn't want to come back to the video later on. I mean, I could have done. I could have left uh, the other computer through the room, rendering it out, and come back to it in two days and finish off the video. But then the course has got this gap in it that's, and it doesn't feel like I've made progress. And if there was something wrong with that, I've kind of moved on, and my head is in a different space at that time. Mm -hmm. So I'm not I'm not good at leaving myself breadcrumbs. I will admit that I often I often stay on one one thing until I've I've done it and then move on, which I think I think has served me well over the years. Rather than trying to be too scattered and ending up, uh, well, going back to what we were talking about earlier, leaving things half finished, because yeah. it may be you leave something half finished because you've forgotten about it or you can't remember where you were. That's the other thing that I've I've fallen foul of. I've opened up blend files going. What was my next task? Why didn't I use the text editor and say what I was doing at the time? You know, leave little breadcrumbs to yourself all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm guessing that's a, a great place to I guess, end the episode where at, if yeah. you end, to, to the listeners listening, if you want to get where you need to be, paying is not a bad thing. And with choosing between a free course and a paid course, a paid course will get you where you want to be way faster than getting lost in the sea of free content out there. Yeah. Yeah, and to totally check out reviews and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. For our courses, we always offer a money-back guarantee. So I, I did one today. Someone bought a course. I, I just said, yeah, sure. That's that's no problem. Here's your, I think it was $19. It's was like, here's your $19 back. I, and if you wouldn't mind, could you let us know why you want the refund? I mean, I'll leave it there. I'm not going to pressure them for it because it might be, oh, I need that money. You know, I, I got less money this month for whatever. Or it could be that, no, it, I didn't like the instructor. It could be, I mean, that's not great feedback, it, but you know what I mean? Um, having feedback is always, always something we personally always incorporate. The number of times I've edited my videos because someone's, I mean, okay, some of, some of the mistakes are, quite bad they're like and if we look over on the left hand side and i move my cursor to the right hand side of the screen because my brain is trying to do several things at the same time yeah. um but yeah some so most of the time we try and edit our videos which is something else as a final note there paid versus free if i produce the free course i'm probably not going to go back and edit any of it mm. even with student suggestions unless it was a really critical error um or if it's to put in like I don't know, a sales thing for the next video that's improved upon this one. Um, mm -hmm. But in all honesty, a, a free course, someone's unlikely to update. On YouTube, it's even impossible to update a video. You can take bits of it out, but mm -hmm. you can't actually update it. So that's one of the one of the things with a paid course is have a look and see whether they plan on doing any updates. I mean, I wouldn't expect someone to continually update something as new versions come out that completely break the course. But that's that's something that we've considered, especially with smaller courses, that if you have 
Uh, Blender goes from Blender 2.9 to maybe Blender 3 in October. Who knows? Yeah. So yeah. is that going to break everything? Probably not, but it will it will change something that means mm. that courses need to be updated. And if it's a minor thing, I'm all for just updating uh, a course and refreshing parts of it that require that new bit. If it's a major thing, like the transition between God 3 and God 4 that's coming out later, that's a huge change. That We can't just go and update a course because actually that's a whole new course. Yeah. So there will, be, there will be times where updating is a viable thing to do, not only from... I mean, it's great to get stuff for free if you bought something. <laughs> of course it is. Um, but there is a point at which it just becomes impractical to do so. And often at that point, we we produce new content, you know, new projects rather than just refreshing refreshing the old ones. Uh, which brings me to, to our last final question. Uh, looking uh, to the future, to the updates coming, what's your most awaited feature for Blender 3.0 that... Every Blender user is awaiting. Uh, probably Cycles X, to be quite honest. Uh, that's such a huge improvement in render speed that uh, it's, it, it's mind-blowing why it wasn't implemented before. It's like, how long have you been sat on this wonderful code? I don't know if it's a new development with new GPU architecture. I haven't dived into the details of it. So for rendering speed, I think for, uh, for Cycle X, Cycles X, and you can download an alpha branch with it at the moment. Um, if you're that risky, don't use it on your main projects, guys. Please don't don't ever save something in an alpha version. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but on top of that, uh, geometry nodes is really changing as we go. Um, it's it's kind of in its infancy at the moment. It's already so so powerful what you can do with it. It is restrictive in certain ways. You've got to think about your models in a very different way. Um, but it's amazing what you can do because you're basically visually coding making models or making scenes so i think there's that that's going to be a real big thing and if they can start homogenizing the different areas of blender and this everything nodes campaign they've got going then i think that's really going to um, make blender a lot easier to use being able to grab uh, something like a generated texture i don't even know that's still possible to grab a generated texture and then that's that's part of your uh uv imaging editing space and use that in uh the the shader node tree i think that's still not possible to do which is a shame because the voronoi for instance that's produced on one part of blender it doesn't match up with the other one so you can end up with kind of this this mismatch so uh, whatever happens to blender there will surely be areas to learn and to create Education content, so yeah, definitely. University. Yeah, it's it's changing all the time. That's 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 a good thing, by the way, and a bad thing. Which is why Blender have released the LTS, the the long term support versions of mm -hmm. Blender. They've gone to uh, people will recognize that from things like Ubuntu and other Linux distributions, where they support a version for a long time, two years in this case which is something I would recommend for anybody embarking on a larger project. It's very, very tempting to switch to the new and shiny thing. But I, I did it when Blender 2.8 came out. I was working on a project and it broke because they removed the, um, uh, they, they switched to Mantaflow for their, for their particle simulations. And obviously anything you'd done prior to that, nope, nope, it's not going to work anymore. Mm. So I was like, I'm midway through this project and I've still kept older versions of Blender on my computer 2.79 um i see it all the time you've got people saying oh my computer can't run blender I can't bl run blender 2.8 and onwards because of the open gl requirements i'm like look at what's possible in blender 2.79 and tell me that that's not a great place to start regardless of not having the new and shiny thing i mean it's it's not it doesn't feel great having to use an old version but some of the things that could be done in those old versions, again, it's, it's, it's like your skill level. You're never going to reach uh, performance issues on your first game, whether you're using Unity, Unreal, or Godot. It's just not going to happen because you're not making a game that's complex enough to ever stress a system. The same with your models. You, you, unless you're doing something silly like turning up subdivisions to like 8, 9, 10, where it's completely unnecessary, or rendering... Uh, with like a thousand or five thousand or ten thousand samples when using cycles, mm. again, 
those are not necessarily problems with the engine. That's that's your understanding of it rather than an issue with the engine. This I guess goes back to okay. saying with the it's not a tool, it's the artist. Yeah, hundred percent hundred percent. You I'm pretty sure someone could make something amazing in MS Paint. I'm pretty sure someone yeah. has made and something they, amazing in yeah, MS Paint. They do. They yeah, do. They, they go viral on the on the yeah, social media. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and again, yeah. that's a, t- a tool should enable you to be the better a, a better artist. It doesn't make you a better artist. That's 100. Mm. percent The same as um, do you use VS Code, VS Studio, uh, you know, Xcode? Th- those are just tools to help you code. It doesn't make your coding better. Right, yeah. and if you want to get better, you can you can definitely use Michael's content to learn. Mm-hmm. You certainly so, can. So uh, thanks, Michael. For You're welcome. Joining us today, the conversation was mm-hmm. really great. Yeah. Uh, you want to I think your we can social media uh, anywhere. That yeah, I, I just wanted. You. Yeah. 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 So where, where, uh, where people can find your stuff online? So canopy dot games. So www canopy dot games. Uh, mm-hmm. That is the actual domain, by the way. <laughs> We found it. Like, yeah, that suits us. Rather than having a .code at UK or something else on the end of it, mm-hmm. and so yeah, Canopy Games is the website, and then we've got uh, we've got Canopy Games Limited on Twitter, and also Tech Ed Mike on Twitter. So I I tend to post more of the Blender stuff rather than the game development on my own channel there, and then we've got the YouTube as well. If you search for Canopy Games or Michael Bridges, I should should come up there. I'm not a footballer before anybody asks. Um, <laughs> I, I do a good impression of someone hoofing the ball completely the wrong direction. I'm very good at that, but not very good at football itself. So there you go. I guess I guess you also have Discord, right? Uh, Discord, yes. If you go to, again, on, on the Canopy Games website, I've set up a link to get there nice and easy. Um, so you go to www.canopygames, uh, canopy.games, and then forward slash P, that's annoying. That's the way that Teachable, our underlying platform, set it up, and then forward slash Discord, and that will take you to the Discord channel. Yeah, and if you enjoyed our conversation today, mm-hmm. you can also listen to Michael as a part of the Blender Nest podcast, of course. Yes, so. I really enjoyed chatting with those guys over on the Blender Nest. The um, and and again, if if anybody wants to reach out with any questions, I do my best to help as many people as I can. Ultimately, if I can get into a position where I can do this totally for free i mean i'll change the i'll change the business business model and, and do it and ultimately that's going to require funding from somewhere else but we're not at that position just yet so when we're there i hope to be able to do more and more free content but if you've got a question and i can answer it quickly i love doing that sort of thing over on my youtube channel all right so people keep on learning and keep on rendering and see you in the next episodes see you all bye 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 <laughs>